Tonight's Bible reading comes from Esther chapter 3. After these events, King Xerxes honoured Haman, son of Hamadatha the Agagite, elevating him and giving him a seat of honour higher than that of all the other nobles. All the royal officials at the king's gate knelt down and paid honour to Haman, for the king had commanded this concerning him. But Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honour. Then the royal officials at the king's gate asked Mordecai, Why do you disobey the king's command? Day after day they spoke to him, but he refused to comply. Therefore they told Haman about it, to see whether Mordecai's behaviour would be tolerated. For he had told them he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honour, he was enraged. Yet having learned who Mordecai's people were, he scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. Instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy all Mordecai's people, the Jews, throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes. In the twelfth year of King Xerxes, in the first month, the month of Nisan, they cast the pur, that is the lot, in the presence of Haman to select a day and month. And the lot fell on the twelfth month and the, tw- the month of Adar. Then Haman said to King Xerxes, There is a certain people dispersed and scattered among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom, whose customs are different from those of all other people, and who do not obey the king's laws. It is not in the king's best interest to tolerate them. If it pleases the king, let a decree be issued to destroy them, and I will put 10,000 talents of silver into the royal treasury for the men who carry out this business. So the king took his signet ring from his finger and gave it to Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. Keep the money, the king said to Haman, and do with the people as you please. Then on the 13th day of the first month, the royal secretaries were summoned. They wrote out in the script of each province and in the language of each people all Haman's orders to the king's satraps the governors of the various provinces and the nobles of various peoples. These were written in the name of King Xerxes himself and sealed with his own ring. Dispatches were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with the order to destroy, kill and annihilate all the Jews, young and old, women and little children, on a single day, the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. A copy of the text of the edict was to be issued as law in every province and made known to the people of every nationality so they would be ready for that day. Spurred on by the king's command, the couriers went out and the edict was issued in the citadel of Susa. The king and Haman sat down to the drink, but the city of Susa was bewildered. This is God's word. Always get this mixed up. Let's pray together. Our Father, this sometimes interesting book we read about how you rescued your people. For us, sometimes, as we read it, can be surprising with some of the things that come out of it, some of the ways that people respond, the way that you work in the background but are clearly working in the book, the way that you bring deliverance to your people, the way that you never abandon your people, and as dire as things might seem, You remain sovereign over them, and your purposes are always accomplished. We thank you for this book. We thank you for all that it reminds us of and teaches. And as we spend some time wrestling with this chapter, 
We ask that you would give us the kind of insight we cannot have unless your spirit enables us to understand. And point us in the right direction, we pray. Help us to understand what you are saying to us as your people today in 2022 when we are so far removed from this incident. And we ask that you would enable us to apply your word in a consistent manner for Jesus' sake. Amen. There's a story told by the writer Alexander Solchine who describes a surreal scene when Stalin was still around at the 1937 conference of the Communist Party in the Soviet Union. Now, I'm assuming, I shouldn't assume anything, that all of you know who Stalin is, the great Russian dictator during the 1920s, 1930s, and 1940s. Uh, he was brutal. I think he died in the early 50s. Uh, the applause, and I quote, the applause went on six, seven, eight minutes. They were done for. Their goose was cooked. They couldn't stop now till they collapsed with heart attacks. At the rear of the hall, which was crowded, they could, of course, cheat a bit, clap less frequently, less vigorously, not so eagerly. Nine minutes, ten, insanity, to the last man. With make-believe enthusiasm on their faces, looking at each other with faint hope, the district leaders were just going to go on and on, applauding, till they finally fell where they stood, till they were carried out of the hall on stretchers. This is a true story. At last, after 11 minutes, imagine applauding for 11 minutes nonstop. After 11 minutes of nonstop clapping, the director of a paper factory finally decided enough was enough. He stopped clapping and sat down. A miracle. To a man, everyone else stopped dead and sat down, Solchan said. That same night, the director of the paper factory was arrested and sent to prison for 10 years. Authorities came up with the official reason for his sentence, but during his interrogation, he was told, don't ever be the first to stop applauding. Imagine, imagine being sent to prison for 10 years because you stopped applauding at a conference meeting of Scott Morrison. Be unheard of. It's so far removed from us. And this chapter reminds us of what happens when you get despots in power and they have absolute authority and absolute power and they use that power in order to further their aims, even though those aims are absolutely immoral and unbiblical. It is a story about the corruption of power in high places. And when you think about our world today, and you look back even over the last 20, 30, 40 years, you can see so many times where governments have used their power and corrupted the outcomes of what they've decided to do because they have such power. And because people find it difficult to know how do you respond have we not even in Australia heard of corruption that's happened in high places? Whether it's money being used for prostitutes or whatever the cause might be. Where money is being abused for personal trips overseas that these officials take and, and abuse the power that they have. Or whether it's as Christians being in the minority and having laws passed in a country that we know are anti-biblical. And yet because we are in the minority and the government simply go with the crowd and go with the majority of the people, there's a sense in which we feel powerless to know how to resist that. How do you stand in a society like that? You see, the question that the Jewish people are faced with in this chapter is how do you remain faithful when everything is against you? 
When your faith is threatened, when the very essence of who you worship may cause you to lose your life, how do you remain faithful in circumstances like that? Now for us, it may not be that we face with as dire situation as that. But when the government happens to overreach into our lives, how do you and I remain faithful to the gospel in those circumstances? It's not an easy question to answer, is it? Because it's less direct for us in Australia. We, we don't have a situation where the government interferes much into our personal lives. But what if in the future we are faced with that? What if in the future things become, reach a point where it becomes difficult for us as Christians to live in our society? Will we still stand upon our faith? Firstly, I want you to notice the cause of the abuse of power, verses 1 to 7. For the sake of time, I won't reread the verses. The cause of the abuse of power. Now there's a surprise here right at the beginning. I'm sure you noticed it. The very first verse, after these events. Now, you as the reader are reading that and saying, after these events, well, how come after these events, what events? The events in the previous chapter. What happens in the previous chapter? Mordecai alerts the king of a plot that's against him, and so he saves the king's life. Now, after these events, how come it's Haman who's being honored and not Mordecai being honored? There, there almost seems to be a contradiction here. And it's a reminder that sometimes things don't always work out the way they're meant to work out. But when we read after this, what we discover is that the narrator who writes under the inspiration of God's Spirit is, is not saying after these events immediately, but rather there's been probably, by the time Esther is elevated to queen, a five-year gap. So this is in year 12 of the reign or, uh, of, of Xerxes, and, and she's elected, or she becomes queen in year 7 of his reign. So five years have elapsed. But nevertheless, we are reminded in this situation that sometimes the right people don't always get elevated to positions or don't get recognized for the contribution that they've made. And the danger that you and I face as those who may be overlooked because of our Christian faith is that we try and orchestrate our own elevation. But what you can't miss in this, what you can't not fail to see, is that the reason Mordecai is not elevated is because it's not part of God's sovereign timing. It's not right for him to be elevated just yet. He is going to get elevated. And when he is elevated and he is recognized for what he has done to the king, then he is going to be able to use that position that uh, is given to him in a way that will protect and help God's people in this situation. In other words, my dear friends, don't feel that you, if you've been overlooked and not been recognized for some act of service that you've given, that God is not working in the background to bless you sometime in the future. After all, it's not about human recognition. It's about recognition from God. Yet behind the scenes, God oversees this. Uh, and he knows what's going on and he knows what his people face. Notice too that we are told you that Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agite. Now, why does he mention he's the Agite? Well, we ask the question, from where do the Agites come? Where are their origins? And they are part of the Amalekites. Now, that then in turn causes us to think back to an incident that happened in Exodus chapter 15, 17 rather that describes the Israelites in the desert having to fight the Amalekites who opposed them. So what we're seeing here is there's some history between the Amalekites and between the Israelites. And there are old grudges that are, are surfacing with Haman and Mordecai. Exodus 17, 13 to 15. Let me read it to you. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Then Yahweh said to Moses, 
Write this on a scroll as something to be remembered. And make sure that Joshua hears it because I will completely blot out the memory of Amalek from under the heavens. Moses built an altar and called it, The Lord is my banner. Fast forward to 1 Samuel 9 verses 1 to 2 and verses 15, 1 to 9. And what do we have? We have God saying to Saul, destroy the Amalekites. And Saul goes after the Amalekites, and then he destroys them, except he saves the king. And Samuel then finds Saul, and he sees he's not only saved the king, but he's kept all the, all the produce that's come from them. And, and Samuel says to Saul, what's this bleating I hear in my ears? Why is the king still alive? And Saul, as per usual, has always got an excuse for everything, and so he gives an excuse to Samuel. Well, I'm keeping the, the animals to, to, to be able to offer them as a sacrifice to the Lord, and, and, and you know, I was uh, spared the king's life for whatever reason he wants to spare his life. And, and uh, then Samuel ensures that the king is killed in front of all of them. And so there are deep-rooted animosity between the Amalekites and the Israelites. And so Haman is raising these back to the surface. What also complicates the issue, from what tribe does Mordecai come? He's a Benjamite. What about Saul? Saul's also a Benjamite. And Saul is the one responsible for the wiping out of the Amalekites. So you can see there is massive animosity already in this situation. This is Haman saying, at last I have an opportunity to take revenge for hundreds of years of animosity that's built up. And I am able to wipe out now this nation. But he can't do it himself. But he'll get permission to do it. So this is then now reinforced when Haman walks through the gates and all the officials bow to him as per the king's command. Notice that the king commanded, verse 2, the king had commanded this concerning him. Now when you read that, there's a hint that the author is giving us that the command that is given for officials to bow down to, to Haman is probably because... He's unworthy. Because they would have bowed down anyway to an official higher than them. That is normal practice. The fact that the king has to command them to do it. The author is hinting here that perhaps Haman is unworthy of the honor that the king has accorded him. Mordecai refuses to bow. So now you can understand. He doesn't bow. The people gather around Mordecai. And they say to Mordecai, why why, why don't you kneel? Why won't you kneel? And we're not told why. And there's been all kinds of speculation. And if the text doesn't tell us why, there's no point in us speculating except to say there are instances in the Old Testament where Israelites do bow down as a mark of respect and honor. But the author doesn't tell us why Mordecai doesn't bow. And the reason he doesn't tell us that is because it's not part of the central theme to the story. So we're not going to speculate there. We'll just move on. These officers tell Haman uh, that, that Mordecai is not bowing. And notice how they repeatedly say to him, day after day, they spoke to him, verse 4. But he refused to comply. And therefore they told Haman about it to see whether Mordecai's behavior would be tolerated, for he had told them that he was a Jew. Now what you see going on here is this intense form of peer pressure trying to cajole him, trying to get him to bow. But Mordecai stands firm. Now without getting lost out of the the main plot of this story, there's a lesson there for us, isn't there? How difficult it is sometimes for our Christian faith when we put under pressure over and over and over again by our unbelieving friends and maybe even our believing friends to compromise our faith. How important it is for us to stand 
stand. Now the officers tell Haman that Mordecai is a Jew. The ethnicity is important to this. Notice they don't talk about his religion. They talk about his ethnicity. Because there are other nations who are also part of the Persian kingdom. After all, Haman is a foreigner, isn't he? He's an Amalekite. And so they're careful not to make this a religious thing, just an ethnicity uh, issue. He's a Jew. It highlights the central problem. How does one remain a loyal citizen when the state or people in the state oppose you and oppose your very existence? Is this not the question that many Christians have had to wrestle with throughout the world? How do you remain a loyal citizen to the state when Stalin shuts down all the churches in Russia? How do you remain a loyal citizen to the state when Idi Amin in Uganda persecutes Christians? How do you remain a loyal citizen to the state when Pol Pot wipes out millions of people? How do you remain a loyal citizen of the state when you live in Iran and Christianity is frowned upon and banned in many cases and Christians lose their lives to the point where Christianity is shrinking more and more in Iran. And so we can multiply the examples. How do you remain a faithful, loyal system, a citizen in Australia when the state condones homosexual marriage? How do you remain a loyal citizen in Australia when the state condones abortion? How do you remain a loyal citizen in Australia when the state champions transgenderism? Yeah, these are difficult questions to wrestle through, aren't they? It's not simply an easy issue to have to deal with, but this is what we have faced. It's a challenge for people of faith today to remain faithful to Christ, to stand up for the values that are consistent with Christ, to not allow ourselves to be intimidated, threatened into compromise because we are a lone voice, because we are going against the grain, because the aggression is so rife out there when you say what we believe, I was just reading again a recent interview of Israel Folau. Remember the furore around Israel Folau's post on Facebook and how it cost him his place in the Wallabies. And he was recently interviewed by someone because he's now playing rugby in Japan and is going to be playing rugby for Samoa in the World Cup next year. And they were asking him, do you regret the post you put on Facebook that cost you your position in the Wallabies? And Falau said, no, I don't regret it. I stand by what I wrote. Will you and I stand by what we believe when the state pressurizes us? Will we remain loyal to Christ? Will we bow to peer pressure? Will we succumb to the strong voices out there that point fingers and call us all kinds of names, you bigot? How dare you judge? You have to listen to this morning's sermon. Judge not, lest you be judged. Will we as Christians say no, but God's word declares and I must stand upon this and even though there may be promotion of transgenderism in school curriculum, I cannot condone that. I cannot support that. I cannot meekly bow and say that's okay. I cannot support when 12 and 13 year olds have access to medical procedures that will cause them to have operations to try and change them from a boy to a girl, from a girl to a boy. 
I must oppose that. I must stand for truth. And I must say to our government, that's not right. God says that's not right. Will we stand? They're hard questions to wrestle through, aren't they? Because they're very relevant questions that you and I face right now. Haman's ego is greatly offended by Mordecai. Thus reveals he's no better than the king. We've seen through Nathan as he's preached previously, as Pastor Nathan has helped us to understand this terrible character of of the king and how bad Xerxes really is and how deeply sinful he is. Well, Haman's no better. They are two peas in a pod. They cast from the same mold. He's just as evil as Xerxes. And now his ego is offended. I mean, that's what it's about, isn't it? He, he, his ego is offended. I mean, the, the Mordecai won't bow to me. How dare you not bow to me? This is nothing than an egotistical man who now is going to not just take out his revenge against a one person, but now extends that to an entire nation. Yes, there are some people who are out of Persia, who are back in the promised land, who are rebuilding the, the, the walls to Jerusalem. Yes, we understand that. So not all the Jews are in Persia. But those who have remained in Persia, he seeks to wipe them out. That's a significant amount of people, nevertheless. Revenge knows no limits. And so he arranges, and there's irony here, he arranges for the lot to be cast, the purr. You'll notice that. Um, he goes to astrologers, and he gets them, because that's how they did it, gets them to cast these stones, these magic stones, and there's incredible irony. Because the word that is used there, purr, is going to become a festival in Israel, Purim. That's going to recall this event. That's going to be something the Jews celebrate here on out. So, so Mordecai, uh, uh, Haman's lucky day where he casts the lot through these astrologers or magicians is in fact going to be his unlucky day. Because as a result of casting those lots, ultimately it's going to cost him his life. He doesn't know that yet. But it is going to cost him his life. He's going to be hanged on the gallows. He tries to find an appropriate day. I'll tell you what else is interesting about the casting of the lots. And let me just take a quick aside, Jan, a very brief aside, because my time is going. It's a reminder to believers, is it not? That we should not consult anything that is unbiblical in terms of seeking guidance. So let me just make this really practical. I get horrified when I hear of Christians who say, I'm reading about my star sign. You know, I'm Capricorn or Pisces or Scorpio, whatever. And, and I read the daily horoscope, and it is a horoscope. It's full of horror. And, and I'm just seeing what it's saying. You know, oh, look, it's saying I'm going to get into a relationship. Yippee! That's condemned in Scripture outright. Shame on you if you're consulting the horoscopes. Confess, repent, put it right. He seeks to get his revenge. The other interesting thing is the day he casts lots is the day before the Passover. What does the Passover celebrate the very next day? It celebrates God's salvation. It celebrates the great day of salvation that God took the people out of Egypt and delivered them from the hands of Pharaoh. Is there not a message in there that this man is plotting a day to wipe out the entire nation and the very next day after he determines the date at the end of the year, that gives him 12 months to prepare, by the way, that now suddenly the very next day they're celebrating God's deliverance. It was a reminder to the Israelites, in other words, that God is in control of this situation. That in spite of the threat that is going to be leveled against them, in spite of the edict that's going to be delivered throughout the nation, that God is still in control. And even God's enemies, even those who are plotting to do harm to God's people, remain under the firm control of God's hands. Gee, there's tremendous encouragement in there, isn't there? 
It's very easy as a Christian to become a little bit despondent when we see how evil prevails in this world, how so many evil people seem to get away with their sin, and how often they seem to triumph, and how often Christians seem to get suppressed in the, in the, uh, the decisions that are made. And yet we need to understand that overseeing all of that, what happens in this world, even when there are plots against Christians, God is sovereignly working out his purposes. And though the anti-Semitism will grow, giving them 12 months will give them ample time to prepare their defenses. So even the timing of when that edict is issued and even the timing of when it will be enacted at the end of the year is God's way of ensuring that in that 12-month period, his people will be fully prepared the moment that edict is enacted. God's in control. So whatever evil may be perpetrated against you as God's child, whatever sinful actions might be directed at you, however depressed and difficult it might be for you, remember, God's got it in hand. He's got it in hand. Proverbs 16.33, I love this Proverbs. I love Proverbs, actually. Declares, the lot is cast into the lap, but every decision is from Yahweh. So you can cast the lot, but ultimately it's God who decides. There are no flukes in this world. There are only sovereign appointments and sovereign decisions as God works out his purposes. Moreover, the Passover points us forward to another great day of salvation, does it not? You cannot celebrate the Passover without realizing that the Passover is a forerunner to the Lord Jesus Christ, who will come as the true Lamb of God, whom John points at in John chapter 1, verse 21, it says, 29, it says, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So that as they're celebrating Passover, there is still in there the hope that the Savior is going to come, that the true King of Kings will come, that a King who is righteous and just and will enact his justice is coming for the Jews. That is the hope yet to be. That is the hope for us looking back that has already occurred. Jesus has come. Jesus has died on the cross. Jesus has provided the great day of salvation so that all who are in rebellion to him, all who are unrepentant, can find forgiveness at the foot of the cross. And Jesus' salvation is much greater than the salvation of the Israelite people. And so we are reminded that even though the cause of our pain and suffering might come from evil intentions of people that God is still overseeing this whole process. And God is behind the scenes pulling the strings, ensuring the right outcomes at the right time according to his sovereign purposes, which are always for our good. Secondly, I want you to notice the corruption of the abuse of power, verses 8 to 15. The corruption of the abuse of power. Haman doesn't have the power to issue a decree, but he has the king's ear, and that is enough. And so having access to the king, he approaches him so absolutely mad is he, so bent on revenge that it overpowers him to the point that on the very same day he is informed, he goes to see the king. Look at verse 8. Then Haman said to King Xerxes, there's a certain people dispersed and scattered among the peoples in all the province. That's the day he's received the news. He goes directly into the king's presence. And what I want you to notice here in verse 8 is the way in which he tells a truth, a half-truth, and a whole lie. So what's the truth? Well, the truth is there are certain people dispersed and scattered. That's true, isn't it? 
Israel is dispersed, they are scattered, and they are in this nation of Persia, and they have been taken out of their land, and they are all over the kingdom of Persia. That's true. Then he mixes in a half lie. Notice what he says. Whose customs are different from those of all other people. Well, that's a half truth. What he's implying in that is that their customers are different in the sense that it causes them to rebel against the state laws. But when we read the Decalogue, there's nothing in there that tells us that Israel should not obey the laws of the land that they are in, whatever those laws may be, unless those laws contradict directly the law of God. They are to submit to the state. And in fact, what he really is referring to is the customs, the half-truth is, yes, some of their religious customs are different. So yes, in some sense, he's right but not in the sense that he really means here, but in the sense that, yes, they've got a different religion. Then he tells a lie. And who do not obey the king's laws. Since when does he have proof to justify that generalization? The only thing that's occurred so far is that Mordecai has refused to bow to him. So you've got one individual now who chooses to disobey the king's command to bow to Haman, and now Haman globalizes that, he generalizes that, and he says it's not just one person, all of them are in disobedience to the king. That's a lie. It's an outright lie. It doesn't matter to the king. He listens to Haman uh, to, to, to Haman, and he simply accepts what he says. Doesn't do any investigation. Doesn't go to the trouble of actually independently finding out whether or not the claims of Haman are correct. And you might say, well, well, well why does he? Well, he, he should, because what next does Haman say to him? Let's wipe them all out. Look at verse 9 following. Just as the uh, king... Re oh, sorry, I'm, I've gone over the the wrong page. Um, he says to them, if it pleases the king, let the decree be issued, verse 9, to destroy them. I mean, what kind of a king agrees to the destruction of an entire nation? Callous, unfeeling, not someone who's serving his people, not someone who's interested in their welfare. Someone who's just bent on destruction and committing evil. Then notice the incentive that he gives him. Now we read that, and I'm going to put this in context. And I will put 10,000 talents of silver into the royal treasury. Now Nathan has talked about how the wars have weakened his, his finances. The king ultimately refuses the offer. By then he's had five years to recover some of his finances. But you know how much that is? In terms of the Persian wealth, that's 60% of GDP. 60% of the wealth of the nation, Haman is offering to pay the king. What an incentive. Imagine if some oligarch, billionaire, Jeff Bezos, Amon, uh, from, from Amazon, came and said to Scott Morrison, if you close all the churches in Australia, I'll give you 60% of your GDP. pretty big incentive, wouldn't it? That's the incentive. He tries to now bribe him. But, but Xerxes is so evil and so corrupted by sin and so anti-God, even though he may not realize that, that he doesn't even accept the bribe. He doesn't need a bribe. He's happy just to say, well, look, Amen, take my ring. And the ring, when he gives him his signet ring, so verse 10, so the king took his signet ring from his finger and gave it to Haman, son of Hamadatta, the Agat, the enemy of the Jews. He gives him the ring as the sign of authority. That is giving to Haman unlimited authority to pass an edict on behalf of the king. That is his official signet stamp upon this. So Haman can write what he wants. Such is the king's complete disregard of the people of God. He gives no thought to how many people will suffer. No thought to how many children are going to be slaughtered in this. How many pregnant women are going to be slaughtered. 
How many wives are going to lose their lives? How many older people who can't defend themselves are going to be brutally slaughtered? No thought to that. He doesn't care. Edmund Burke, you all know the quote. Edmund Burke said, All that is required for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. Xerxes is not a good man. He's exactly the opposite. And so evil seemingly is going to triumph, but it's not because God ultimately is in control. And this is in complete contrast to God's people. Is it? Isn't it? God's people who fight for justice. God's people are concerned for those who can't defend themselves. God's people who live righteously and seek righteousness and seek society to live righteously. In contrast to this king who is bent on evil along with Haman. Now, some of you may or, no, may not, may or may not know David Firth. David Firth... Uh, his parents come to this church, Jeff and Denise Firth. David Firth lectured me Old Testament when I was in uh, college in 1993. It's a long time ago. He's now a professor or a, a head lecturer in uh, the UK and lives over there. He comes here occasionally when he comes back to see his parents. has written a commentary. This is what he writes. This story is a constant reminder of why we need vigilance in examining the work of those in power. Because if their power is allowed to develop unchecked, it can end up in directions that are exceedingly evil. And the evidence of this is human history. Just go back. Whether you go to the Greek Empire, the Persian Empire, the Roman Empire, whether you go to Napoleonic Empire, Bismarck of Germany, Stalin of Russia, Saddam Hussein of Iraq, where un, there is unfettered power, the ability of corruption is huge. And while the default position of the Christian is always to submit to the state, we should never lose our voice. We should never think that submission means that we just accept everything the state does. You and I, as God's people, are put here as salt and light. We are to speak prophetically into our world. We are to speak about what God has revealed in his word. We are to do it in a way that is, is going to be consistent with our Christian values. But nevertheless, we have a voice. You must never lose that voice. Ultimately, such abuse of power and corruption drives us as God's people. And for the Israelites to ask, is there not a better way? Because at the end of the day, as Pastor Nathan pointed out last week, when you have unfettered power in the hands of a human being, no matter how good that human being may consider themselves to be, there is always the potential for corruption. And the, the potential for corruption exists precisely because they are human and sinful. And those who are not Christian, even Christians suffer in, the, in, the, in, in that respect. We've seen abuses in Christian Verted commerce churches of men who have had too much power at the top and have abused that power in terrible ways. And so this drives us to ask the question. You see, you meant to ask the question. Is this all there is to human government? Is this the best as humans that we can do? Is this our lot to have to suffer under the hands of evil governments? Or evil rulers? Is there not something more to rule than this? And the answer, of course, is an emphatic yes. 
because it drives us forward inevitably to Jesus Christ, who is the only true king, who is the only one who knows how to handle power in the right way and never, ever uses his power and never, ever corrupts the power that he has. And it should cause for us a longing in us to well up within us to say, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. For you are the true king. You are the only one who will bring true justice in this world. You are the only one we can trust. Furthermore, it propels us to realize that our king has shown us what it means to live in a corrupt world. How you are to handle yourself. He provides a model of leadership for us. And what is that model of leadership that Jesus provides? He is the ultimate servant leader. He leads by serving. He leads, we are told in Mark 10 verse 45, let me read the verse to you. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. He teaches us what true leadership and service looks like. It caused God's people to emulate the Lord Jesus Christ, to follow his pattern. If I may quote from David's commentary again, you see, notice the end, and then I'll quote, and then I'm done. It says, the king, last verse, the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was bewildered. That's really important. They're confused. After all, if the king's willing to wipe out the Jews, who's safe? Who's next? Which non-ethnic group are going to be the next lot who are slaughtered? This confusion shows why believers need to keep a vigilant eye on those in power. Where chapter 2 showed that it is possible to live and function even within an oppressive state, this chapter shows that limits remain. The notable thing is that even those who are not the intended victims suffer from it while the perpetrators find ways of closing themselves off from its implications. Now listen, this is from David, not, this is not me, this is the commentary. Biblical faith will not, however, permit such actions to remain unchallenged, and the allusions to the Passover hint at an alternative view, one that knows the only power to which we ultimately submit is God. The Bible generally encourages believers to submit to the state's authority. But this is never an uncritical acceptance because it also knows that the state sometimes embodies all that is opposed to God. The community's confusion here is a sure sign that this was a time when the state's working needed to be both scrutinized and resisted. Yes? Yes? There is a time to do that. Yes, even living in Australia. Now don't misunderstand me. That's not to say we're anti-government. That is to say that we will keep our government to hold them to account. We must. It is our duty not only to God, but to our fellow man. Because we have the truth. God's given it to us. We know what's right. We know what's wrong. We know what's destructive and falls within our realm to ensure that we are fighting for God's justice, for God's righteousness, for God's ethics, God's morals, God's ways. And we must do what we need to do in order to ensure that thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That righteousness characterizes us. You know what the proverb says? I always forget the reference in 16, I think. It might be verse 9. 
Righteousness exalts a nation. But sin brings disgrace to any people. It's our responsibility to show leadership, to uphold righteousness in this nation, to hold our government to account when they do things that are contrary to the word of God. In the right way, we need to do that. Don't misunderstand me. But we can't just act passively and sit back and say it's someone else's responsibility. That famous quote from Niemöller, the German theologian who lived during the time of Nazism in Germany, and I can't remember it off by heart, but it goes something like, first they came for the homosexuals, then they came for the whatever, and then they came for that, and then they came for the Jews, and no one said anything, and we had no voice left to say. You see, passivity may be the least part of the resistance. It may be easy. But what if they come for you one day? Then what? Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word that reminds us of remaining faithful to you in spite of sometimes being in situations where our government is not acting in your best interests and therefore not in the best interests of its citizens. We know that to be true. The citizens may not even know that. But help us as your people to stand for what is right, to stand for justice, to fight for righteousness. Help us not to allow ourselves to get sucked into that which is evil through being passive. Give us wisdom and discernment to know how to do that in a way that will not dishonor you, in a way that will not disgrace you, but in a way that will show what true leadership looks like, what true faithfulness looks like, what true spirituality looks like. Give us courage, give us wisdom, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's stand as we sing our final song.